think you have to share my screen. Oh, do I need can, to? Sorry. You, oh, oh, sorry. Well, I think I can. Can you do that? Oh, I can do that. Okay. Okay. Um, could you do it once again? No. Okay. Yeah, it looks good. All right. So thank you very much for your time coming over here. I know uh, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to come to seminars uh, after the COVID. So, so thank you so much. I'm going to speak like this. Probably it's easier for me to speak so I can use my uh, laptop as well. Um, just to, uh, Richard, thanks a lot for introducing myself. And then uh, just to tell you that you can go to our website that we do something about city scale modeling. We also do, and my, my heart is computational geomechanics because I'm a geotechnical engineer by training. And then I do a lot of geotechnical uh, modeling. Uh, we also do geothermal uh, system, uh, which I'll show you a little bit where we're going. And then uh, uh, I'm in geotechnical construction. So machine learning for construction infrastructure and sensing. And um, what I wanted to do today was a little bit entertain you. And I can be a little bit, Theoretical, but then I thought with the, uh, your interest in our interest in variety of different things, I thought I should talk about different things today. And then obviously the devils are in the details and we can, we can meet again. And I'm so close. I've walked here in 10 minutes, so we can meet again and discuss about things. But hopefully some of the uh, things I show you today uh, excite you and then we can talk further more. Uh, before I start, I wanted to show this. Um, Richard, do you know Sydney Brenner? I don't. No. <laughs> you know, no prize, a winner of the Messenger RNA. He was at Cambridge. Right. And then he actually he moved to California, Berkeley, some time ago. And uh, he, he it was quite interesting because this was the quote that he made. Mathematics is an art of perfection. Physics is an art of optimum while biological system are just satisfactory. <laughs> because if it's not satisfactory, it will be eliminated as capital punishment is very, very strong in the biological system. <laughs> so that's what he said. And I was fascinated about this because I said, oh, that can be infrastructure too. Infrastructure systems are just satisfactory because we've been living this for many, many centuries. And because uh, it will be eliminated as political, legal, economic, community constraints are very, very strong in infrastructure systems. But what I wanted to say was that thinking about the COVID and how things transform with this messenger RNA, can we do better in terms of our infrastructure system? And that's what we're trying to do at, in civil engineering department and perhaps working with you. So there was a step change in the medical practice by COVID vaccine, which I was fascinated to see. Do we need to have that big thing to make it happen? But then the question is that, how can we do? Uh, do we need to wait for a big earthquake, like what you're doing to make our infrastructure better? But can we do a step by step? Uh, in our um, infrastructure, um, just to talking about the issues that we have in civil engineering, we tend to design our infrastructure 100 years. So all the pipeline you see is like 100 years design life. And then, but then if you work with East Bay Mud or other kind of Caltrans, they will say, I want to prolong the life of the infrastructure because I don't have money or because the infrastructure looks okay. So the question is that how do we have a life extension of 150 years or so? But then if you look at the demand of infrastructure, if you see San Francisco, Berkeley here 30 years ago, it's totally different from right now. And it's gonna to be totally different in 30 years from now. So everything changes in 30 years. So, so there's a mismatch in time in terms of how we use our infrastructure and how we build our infrastructure. So, so there's a change in demand actually every 20, 40 years, as you know, and then that's why we call it aging infrastructure. It's not infrastructure is aging, it's really the way we use have changed and therefore it looks like it has aged. On the other hand, we are, have a spirit of trying to say, can we do using monitoring or smart infrastructure? And, um, but the point is that lifetime of sensors or data analytics has to go for another 30, 40 years when it's been useful. So the question is, what kind of a sensor is available to do that? How can we attach our sensors? That will last for 100 years or so. So that's an interesting challenge that we have. So just to say that our 100 years design life may not be compatible with the actual demand, and that's why we're quite interested in, in working this area. 
So would it be nice to say to our future generation, you don't have to worry about no more aging infrastructure? So that is the big spirit that we have uh, in our civil engineering department. At least I have. So, so uh, in the past decade, we've seen a lot of sensing technologies, and I know your colleagues and yourself work on this, and we do as well. So the computer vision and LIDAR, I know uh, Roland uh, works on satellite and all these things. Uh, today, we'll talk a little bit about distributed fiber optic system because we can embed sensor for long life because the cable itself is made of silica, so it's gonna last for many, many decades. So, so for me, it's an interesting sensor because it's not mechanical, it just, that is a sensor, material is a sensor. So it will last for a long time if you can attach it or bury it for many, many years. Wireless sensor network is something that we, it really happened in the past 10 years, I'll show you a little bit, because you can continuously monitor at difficult to access sites, and I'm sure some of your colleagues are working in this app. But the point here is that most of these sensors can come to sort of a 10 to 20 millimeter, three to five millimeter, point some millimeter range of precision. And actually in geotechnical engineering, when building owner says, don't move by building, they're talking about millimeter movements. So, so it comes to the situation that we have a sensor that the, our owners are demanding, make sure my building doesn't move this much. And that's why it really made big change in the past 10 years or so. Obviously we're interested in how these technologies uh, sort of are used in practice. Uh, we are working on a variety of systems like our Boston Dynamics robot. So we have a problem hiring faculties because of the uh, budget cut, but then we do have a new faculty called Bob. <laughs> But uh, the, the question really is, uh, how can, can we use this spot? And so we have one, and then we're asking students, can we use this for something about infrastructure, like looking after our uh, river levees, for example. But the one that you see on the left is some sort of, a, it's some uh, emerging technologies that I've been sort of thinking about in terms of what we call hype cycle, is that you have a hype, and then it goes down, which is trough of disillusionment, and then you have something coming into the practice. And you can see that like LIDAR, wireless sensor network has gone to that peak already and come to practice. Uh, fiber optics, I think um, I started this about 15 years ago. I had a good hype with getting a lot of funding. It's going down, but then maybe you guys are getting hype. But the point here is that we're, we're coming to that particular right now. And it's coming into practice because like there's a new BART extension into San Jose and in the lining, they said, let's put fiber optics. It took me 15 years to persuade to put in the specification, but it's really happening in that way. So, so you start to see uh, the sort of a community uh, start to think about putting fiber optics in infrastructure. But the only way is to demonstrate and works in the field. A wireless sensor network is something that we've been working for the past 15 years or so. You can see when I was at Cambridge, I spent 22 years at Cambridge before coming back here. But then during that time, we did a lot of infrastructure sensing and then one of the devices, which is 2009. So that's only 10 plus years ago, we created, look at the big battery that it has. And then we put it in London underground and then we keep on failing and all these things. But then three years later, we created another one in 2012 and that's been out called Wise Innovation, and now it's part of the Leica geosystem uh, monitoring system. So, so it, it sort of, a, and then we had another student coming in 2015, and then saying that I want to spin out again. So you can see eight power and eight bar uh, Atterbury. These are the spin out, my students spin out and try to make companies out of these wireless sensor technologies. Eight power is the vibration harvesting ones with wireless. So, so if you put it near the sort of machine vibration, it can take that vibration and energy and then take temperature readings for, for um, sort of pumps and all these things and send signals. Atterbury is a small miniature device. You can see a sort of one pound coin and then it's a small device, but it can talk to each other. And by talking to each other, it tries to look at relative movement of these two sensors or multiple sensors. And then it gives you the movements and this particular uh, devices, uh, which is part of Leica, you can see a lot of devices now. And the point is that there came out from the standard device like tilt meter that we use in practice 
vibrating wire strain gauge that we use in practice. But the only thing is that we change from wired to wireless. And that was a big thing for us because at construction industry, we use a lot of these. Uh, we need to do a lot of monitoring, but then it's very difficult to access sites. So, so a wireless sensor did transform our construction industry in the past 10 years. It's just a 10 years and just came into the market. What are the two important things that happen in wireless sensor systems? One is called long range multi sort of a, a mesh network. So what you can see is that these network work can hop for one kilometers using what we call LoRa uh, devices. So you can pop for 750, one kilometer. So, so you can do hop, 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 and you can do many hops, but depending on the uh, product you use. For example, the one that I showed you can do six hops. So you can try to create a mesh network like what we see in our Wi-Fi system. It's now mesh Wi-Fi. And that's what we see in our practice as well. So long distance is something that we're very, very uh, made it happen. And because it's long distance, uh, it, it, uh, it allows us to also go to shorter distance in a very complex uh, environment as well. The other one is about low power devices. So for example, if you do for left, which is low sampling data rate, like temperature, humidity, light orientation, let's say you take a sort of an hourly monitoring under this mesh network, and then you let's have a tilt mode, Theoretically, that typical battery that you see on the right over here, uh, theoretically can last for 10 to 15 years because these are really, it goes to deep sleep and then creates, wakes up and sends signals. And obviously that's for the low sampling rate. For high sampling rate, like acceleration or wind velocity or sound, which you have a sort of 300 Hertz or kilohertz, you have to take readings. Uh, so, so if you do five second selected readings, it takes about one to two minutes to send because these are low, what we call uh, low frequency, like a 900 megahertz type of devices that would, cannot send lots of data like what we see in, five, in the sort of uh, Wi-Fi. But then uh, you can send data, but it takes a long time. But then if you do one hour interval readings, it only lasts for 40 days. So the question really is that how do you scavenge the data like what you saw on the eight power devices, or you can do energy harvesting, or you can do a trigger mode. But what I want to say is that this happened in 10 to 15 years because it was easy for people to say, I do have the data that I know what data looks like, like vibrating wire strain gauge. But then distributed fiber optics was different because it was totally different data sets. It gives the data every point along the fiber for many, many miles. And that created, how can I use this data? And so, so we started 20 years ago, started to work on it, and it's gradually coming into practice, but it did take a long time for people to say, what is the value? And we're still uh, trying to show the value. So you know these uh, fiber optic system, I'm not sure um, much, but just to tell you, these are the fiber optic cables. You have a core where most of the light goes through this nine micron center and most of the light goes through. So you can see that the other end of the light comes out and that's the, your, your fiber optics uh, data is uh, sort of uh, digitized in a certain way in that particular way. So that's why you get your fiber optics communication. Cladding is the one that makes sure that it's fiber light goes through that tunnel. And then you have this buffer and then other coating devices. Now, in terms of technology, what it does is that there are three different important scattering. When you shoot a light, a light comes back at every point along the fiber, which is what we call backscatter light. And so when you shoot a light, it comes back, and then we know where it comes back from because the light is, uh, speed light is constant. So, so the one that comes close, come earlier is close to you, and then something that comes later is far away from you, but that's almost instantaneous because of the speed of light. Now we look at the frequency content of that. And first one is called Rayleigh. Rayleigh is the one that you shoot a light and if that particular position moves, the light comes back a little bit later and then you look at the phase change and then that allows us to say how much it moved. And you can do that by sending different pulses and then trying to get the difference and get strain. But basically it's really a looking at the movement of that particular point of the fiber in, at different locations. 
Now, uh, Brudion, which is this second one, is different, is that when you stretch your cable, actually you change your stiffness. So what it does, the light energy is converted to acoustic energy. And then that gives you the difference in stiffness response and then comes back to the light and comes back. So that means that you're measuring the stiffness change of the material in a sense that you can have a temperature change or the elongation and the crystal changes. So, so that gives you what we call brillion and that is related to change in frequency. So we're looking at the peak shift of this particular scattering and that peak shift is related to strain and temperature. And that is very similar to vibrating wire strain gauge. I'm not sure you know vibrating wire strain gauge. It's like a, a, like a guitar string. So if you have a tension, you have one sound. And if you tune it, you get a different sound, meaning that you have a different strain. So what it does is that the resonant frequency changes, and that allows you to get the strain. And these devices are so robust because actually you're looking at the frequency change. Whereas if you do a foil gauge, which is your resistive gauge, if you have long cables, your resistivity in the cable is so long, whatever you change you make, it's very difficult to change the, see, see the change in strain. So we love vibrating wire strain gauge because we can have a long cables. But it's the same system over here is that we're looking at the shift in frequency and that allows us to measure static uh, strain in this particular case. Raman is, I think it's related to Brownian motion of that particular material and therefore is related to temperature. So that is called distributed temperature uh, uh, sensing. And uh, in, in sort of a history of fiber optic, DTS really started. And then uh, DSS and DAS came in. Um, the, um, Many people in fiber optics, actually, when they started in that particular area, like in the 80s, they all got interested in measuring like this. But then unfortunately, fiber optics communication becomes so popular and big industry, all the academics went to that direction and nobody doing strain left. But then if you talk to some of the old people who are sort of working on that particular one, say, where do you start? They say, I started with a brilliant strain measurement. For the brilliant strain, because it depends on um, strain and temperature, do you also have to do DTS to get the temperature to? Yes, yes. So um, I'll show you the two cables that we use, uh, that we use the same different cables to do temperature compensation. So what I'm going to do today is just to go quickly uh, about different projects that we have to just excite you. And hopefully you can come back and say, OK, let's look at these problems more. So you know our campus, you know our Claremont Hotel, uh, right over the circle that you see on the right. And then that's our Hayward Fault. And you see a Claremont Hotel pool. And then we have that Hayward Fault, Claremont Avenue. And uh, East Bay Mud replaced their pipelines uh, about a year ago. And we said, OK, let's put the fiber optics on this particular uh, uh, fiber uh, on the pipeline. So these are two cables that we use. One is a strain cable, which the fiber is tightly buffered to the surrounding. So if you step on it, there's a strain transfer. But then the other cable is actually the cable is floating inside the gel. So that means that if you step on it, you don't have a strain transfer. So you do that for temperature compensation. So, so even with a brillion, we can do two cables and then we compensate each other with the temperature. So that's my goal, the answer to you. Um, obviously, some people use DTS and brillion to do that one, but the mechanism is different. So, so sometimes two different mechanisms doesn't do the temperature compensation right. But this is what we do. The DAS cable tends to look at more on the temperature side because um, DAS people tend to make sure that you use a, a standard optical fiber. So, so they tend to flow inside the gel. So the coupling is not good for DAS, standard DAS cables. But then we're trying to promote, let's use more uh, tight buffered cables because you have a better um, interaction with the uh, surrounding uh, movements. So here we put the fiber optics and obviously asking the contractor to put the cables on two sides are difficult because you have to put your fingers and hands in it and it's quite dangerous. So I asked them to put it 45 degrees 
on two sides and then um, right at the crown. And then obviously, uh, if you know it's bending, one is in compression and under in tension. So the difference will be the bending strain and the bending strain will give us the curvature of the system, which allow us to understand the shape of the one. And then uh, the, the, the average of the two will give you actual strain. So how much tension or compression it's happening. Uh, the point here is that once we bury a pipeline, we're not going to see it for the next 100 years. So the spirit is that why don't we put embed intelligence right now so that not my generation, but maybe your grandchild generation <laughs> will be saying, oh, that was a great thing to do. <laughs> but we do have a contract. We'll keep on recording, monitoring this workflow for the next 100 years. Not a contract, but then we promise that we'll do that. Somebody has to take care of that. Can you have a quick question? Yeah. So you have a two cable about you know temperature and the strain. One interrogator can record both together, or you have to be put the two separately to separate the measurement? So we have a spliced, so so it goes back and forth and back and forth, and then it's connected to one wow. analyzer. I see. Yeah, yeah. So so we do all the ratings in one go. Okay. Thank you. And actually we do put cables in the trench as well to monitor. Can we monitor the ground movements? Because uh, if we can monitor ground moons and then we can assess the pipeline through that, it's much easier than attaching the cable on the pipeline. I have a naive question. Yeah, yeah. So like commercial cables, you said, are typically just floating in the gel. Yes. So commercial cables, it's difficult to just do strain up for that. Yes. So there's a little bit of, um, of course, there's, if you put 100 strain, maybe it's can measuring one strain. Okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah, because of the slippage. There are some strain transfer. So, so here is a picture of, uh, it shows him well in my, but you can see that how the cables is attached. And uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. So we can put the DAS, we've been putting DAS on this one and trying to measure, a point is that actually we didn't know where the cables is in that one. So, so we did a tapping exercise to find out where the cable is. Can you remind me which are your cables, which are yes. <laughs> so the one on the tape, shown on the tape are the cables. So these are the cables that we attach. Sorry, I'm going very carefully explaining these. Yeah. Those are your cables. These are my cables. So, so what they do is that they attach and then they put the tape on top of it to have a good. And actually what we do is that we put, we have a syringe with epoxy and then we syringe it and then put oh. some epoxy to glue it. And so the pipe itself is something like 30 centimeters in diameter. Yeah, that's right. I think it's a 24 inch. Yeah. But so you really want it attached to the pipe. I mean, if you're epoxy, because that takes a lot of time. Yes. So, so it really is focused on seeing what happens to the pipe as opposed yes. to just seeing the bulk, what's happening in the region of the pipe. Yeah. So, so pipeline engineering assumes what kind of steering that pipe has. I see. Yeah. In terms of design. So, so uh, that is why we want, we have to do it. You know? okay. So, so, oh, sorry. So let's say if you have a pipe and then you sort of lift the pipe, it bulges, right? So it creates a bending. So what you can do is that if you do that, the top part will be in compression and the bottom part will be in tension. And that's what you see on the bottom left a bottom left figure, you can see a raw data. One light, light blue is in tension, and then the bottom is in compression, and the difference is bending strain, and the average is what we call actual strain. And all our design is based on that bending strain versus actual strain and that sort of thing. But then if you don't know the bending strain and actual strain, what you can do is that you can integrate twice to get the shape of the pipe. And that's a, just a beam theory. And then if you do that, you can see how the bending of the pipe is. Now, um, in, in surveying, everybody do measurements. So they want to measure the movements. But my point is that if everything moves as a rigid body, it doesn't matter because it's safe. It's about the strain that is most important for any uh, infrastructure. So we have a California Energy Commission project. We're looking at the strain-based assessment. And now we're looking for the next phase. They're looking at how can we use this distributed strain data to assess our pipeline? Uh, you see Berkeley, uh, we just set up this new center uh, at the Richmond Field Station, testing all these pipelines. 
So, so you can see that uh, we have these uh, big, di large diameter pipeline device that you see on the left top. And these are for 40 inch pipelines that, uh, that they want to look at bending. And then, uh, so, so we're currently, so if you're interested, you can come and see it's a big frame that we have. This box actually came from Cornell University. And you may be interested in this. This is a box. You can see the size of the person is over here. So it's about a two meters size and then 10 meters long and then three or four meters on this sort of width. And then it's a split basin test. So we bury a pipe with a soil and then we do the full rupture and trying to see how it goes. <laughs> and um, so Isaymar has gone to Cornell to test their pipe all the time. And then when the professor at Cornell University I said, I'm going to retire. Ispan Mehmet said, Ispan said, Kenichi, bring it to here. So that's why we brought it here. So that's why it's in Richmond Field Station. Uh, the important one is like, for example, you see a fiber optics attached to the bell. So what we do is that you see this particular fiber attached to the bell. And some analyzer, we can get strain every millimeter, every millimeter. Uh, along that particular one. Unfortunately, this device can only go for 50, kilo, uh, 50 meters long, but it gives you really rich information about strain. So that's why we put a lot of these fiber on the sort of uh, pipes, because we do a lot of these finite element analysis. So this particular figure just gets every millimeter, we have a data and look like a sinusoidal curve. And that is, is a strain along the circumferential part of the pipe. And what it does is that as you pull, it doesn't do nothing, and then it locks. And when it locks, actually, because of the asymmetry of that locking, it starts to squat. And that squat gives you one side tension and the other side compression, and that's what you see. And that gives you the mechanism of failure. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. You have pretty big deformations. Does it happen that the fibers just break? So fiber will break about 1%, 2% strain. So, mm -hmm. so that will be 10,000 micro strain. And does this happen in these experiments? So, so um, it mostly likely happened during the construction process that people just step on it and break it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then, yes, we try to think about, yes, if you're looking for large deformation, it will break and then, so, so, so. Sometimes it's about design that you don't want to glue it too hard because if you look at glue too hard, then you have a very localized strain and snaps it. So we're thinking of how to use a little bit of glue that will peel off as you move it. So you won't go, you won't get the actual strain, but then you can look into that way to, to avoid. So that is some sort of engineering that we need to think about when we deploy in the field. Uh, here's another one. Uh, um, let me just to optimize the video. Sorry. Okay. Uh, are you okay with this? Are you enjoying it? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's too engineering, so I'm not sure. <laughs> But this is an interesting test that we're doing is that we bend a pipeline, pre bend, because nobody makes it straight all the time during the installation. There's always a little bit of imperfection. And then what we do is that as you bend it, we pull and let it fail. So, so I'll show you this picture. Moving. So, so it's being pulled. So you can see now it's been pulled and then you can see a little bit of water coming out. So it is broken, but then water is not leaking. So it's a good joint. <laughs> and then as we can keep on pulling it and then you can see more water coming out, can you see? And then at some point it just fails dramatically. So water is leaking. <laughs> <laughs> Do the pipes typically fail in tension? Like, I guess you're already into to be in tension, but does, is that actually the case? That... Not really. Uh, some It depends on you know more than I do in terms of how fault moves relative to each other. So in the uh, climate, it's 
strikes with. So, so it will be in tension, but then in some cases in compression. So, so actually the joints are designed to think about how much capacity you have in that particular direction. So if you know it's gonna be in compression, you let it move a little bit inside, have a capacity to move inside. I guess what I'm asking is mm. in practice, do pipes tend to break in tension? Like um, no, uh, it, it, tension is a critical one, but then compression is more what we call buckling. Yeah, buckling failure, yeah. So we design for buckling. And uh, some of the pipes like this one, which is uh, probably if you live in Berkeley, your pipes are like these <laughs> and they can bend a lot. Okay. So you can see in the... So again, we're trying to put fiber optics on these so that the pipeline manufacturers start to say, wow, this is interesting. Let's put it into part of the product. And then if East Bay Mud said, do it, they are ready to do it. And that's what we're trying to do. And the reason why we want to measure something in the field is that in engineering, we always do this analysis. So these are fancy finite element analysis with the soil and the pipeline and all of these things. So these are geomechanics simulations that we do to understand if your fault movement is this much, what kind of strain you'll have and depending on the backfill material, it'll be different. But when you go to the field, actually when you go to the field, you see the pipeline, but then you say, oh, what is that? And that's an old abandoned pipeline. And in practice over here, you don't have to recycle the pipeline or put it into landfill. The old pipeline just can stay there. That's our practice. So, so if you look at it, we model soil pipeline interaction by here, we say pipeline soil, pipeline soil interaction. And the question really is that, is this pipeline gonna be good for a pipeline or bad for the pipeline? And we don't know. So the point is that if we can put the fibers in, monitor the actual performance, it will help us to understand is this pipeline is in bad shape or not. So that's a very basic question I realized. So, but you're not attaching interrogators to these pipelines permanently, right? You you go back and you visit periodically. So you don't, so do you, how do you deal with the fact, I mean, how do you, you know, it, you're measuring very careful distances and you're coming back and reconnecting your device. So there isn't an issue about coming back and reproducing the same measurement? Yeah, so, so that is the great thing about this BOTDR devices or frequency change device uh -huh. is because you're just looking at the frequency change and therefore it's not like your resistivity, that connection makes a big difference. So, so it gives you a good strain to come back. Right. Yeah, yeah. But the question really is that, do you want to come back every month or do you want to do 24 seven is another uh, sort of things. And uh, I'll show you a little bit that we have 24 seven uh, devices as well. So here we can be looking at different types of problem. We put this one, bottom one is in uh, McDonald Island with the gas storage one. And then uh, some of the payment, this is Millennium Tower that is sinking. We have worked on that one. This one's in the Treasure Island. You know CPT cone penetration test? You push your cone and get this strain, they, uh, they, they, sort of a ground properties through that. So after you do your cone penetration test, actually we pull out and then put a cone with a fiber and then you push down and grab that particular one. And that gives you an in-place extensometer. And then at Treasure Island, they do a filling and we can see which clay layer is squeezing and how much. Uh, here's something oops, something on the tunnel. Uh, we have a project uh, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Sacramento about uh, cutoff walls. So they have a cementitious cutoff walls for the seepage, uh, stopping for the seepage, and then uh, uh, we can look at, put the fiber optics to look at the cracking of the walls. Uh, anchors. Uh, this one is a big one in Singapore. It, they are putting fiber optics for 51 kilometer long deep sewer tunnel. So there'll be 150 meter kilometers of fiber that they're putting right now and trying to protect their uh, sewer for the next 100 years using this fiber optic system. Uh, we have a project, and this is something which I mentioned that um, on the moon line, can we put the fiber optics to listen to the whales hmm. singing? Uh, the one on the left is, uh, I'm not sure, at Richmond Field Station, we have an earthquake shaking table. 
But then we said, oh, the offshore winds are going floating structures. So floating structures on the current, sea current going like this. So, so we created a shaking at the bottom, mimicking the sort of a shaking of the bottom of the tower, and then use that to monitor the fiber optics on that one. The one on the right is anchor. And the anchoring is interesting because what you get is that this is a strain distribution as you pull. And then this part shows the gradient going up means that it's giving a friction in one direction and this one giving the compression. And that's how we see by looking at the gradient, it gives you what the soil structure interaction is happening. So, so we're not interested in actual magnitude. Actually, we're interested in gradient because gradient give us the frictional characteristic of the soil. And that's why the continuous measurement is really good because I can get the gradient out of this particular data sets. Uh, this is a, the one that I like that at Richmond Field Station, we put the fiber in the pavement. And actually this is a DAS, uh, DAS work that we do. And then uh, my former PhD student, Peter Hubbard's dog runs and we can detect. And the point here is that this particular strain is 0 0.02 microstrain. So that's 20 nanostrain. That's, we, I can't get that strain for uh, using vibrating wire strain gauge or conventional strain gauge. But the point here is that DAS is really good for dynamic strain. But if the dog stays there for a long time, it start to, the, the data get drifted and it's very difficult to get the strain. So, so DAS are very good at very dynamic ones. So that's why it's good for you, but it's not really interesting for us for a certain point. But then uh, we were thinking, okay, can we make this payment like a touch screen of your computer? And that's what we're doing over here is that we show the data and then if the car is running, can we see how much cars, what kind of strain it's getting and that sort of thing. So you can see two cars running along this particular case. And this is the uh, footprint of people running. This is time versus distance. So you can see how fast it's running. What, what's, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> what's the vertical axis on the lower figure? Uh, this one? No, no, on the right. Sorry, lower oh, right this, figure. Oh, this is like a picture looking from the top oh, over here. Oh, and I then see. what we do okay. is that if you step, it shows a color. Oh, it's, it's a map. It's, it's a, a map, map of yeah, where the car is. I see. Got but, it. Uh, it took from some of my students to convert that data to show something like this. But this is really nice because it gives you a, a feeling of how data can be used. Oops. I didn't like it. <laughs> okay. I was going to ask whether the trick sure. is real. Oops. Uh, Close the program, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Is the, is the drip real signal? So it's environmental change of the temperature, hydraulic? No, it, it's more of a system level drift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's so nothing to learn yeah. from the drift. No, I, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the, so so we don't like the drift, <laughs> but um, there are people who are trying to compensate for that in a, a numerical yeah. way. Any questions so far? I think I'm waiting for my computer to start. I think, I think the Zoom and everything is causing this to problem. I'm very sorry about this. So. Mm. You you seem to to keep separate the the strain and the and the acoustic and the temperature, but it's it's the same fiber that does everything, right? Yes. So so the really on we don't take um 
Brilliant, we don't take kilohertz readings. Brilliant is like actually just scan the data, takes about three to 10 minutes okay. for a Brilliant system. So, so it's more of a static strain. So it's it's the post processing that changes. Yes, yes, yes. Where the DAS, you record lots of data, and then what you do is that you use that to, um, you start to select certain frequency to find what you like. Okay. I think I only have 10 minutes. I'm just gonna show you, I was hoping to show you this one, but then obviously I miserably failed to show different things. But I want to show you one more thing before I finish is because it's related to the campus. So, so our UC Berkeley campus is thinking about carbon emission. And we have, a, currently we have a cogeneration plant that will burn natural gas for our heating or all our, many of our electricity. And that's not good for CO2 point of view. So, so in the next few five to 10 years, they will change it to what we call heat pump systems. So it's electrifying the system. And the currently campus is thinking of how do we decarbonize our campus? And you can see there are different regions that we split into the region and then see how we can work together to make it happen. One of the interest is using, because it's heat pump, heat pump is air source heat pump is like our air conditioner where you can use the air condition and use the outside temperature and take the difference to get your heating and cooling. But then you may have heard about ground source heat pump because the ground is actually cooler uh, during the summer and then uh, warmer uh, during the winter. So, so during the uh, sort of uh, summertime, you generate a lot of heat to, by cooling inside, but then can we dump that heat into the ground? Typical ground source heat pump is used the temperature difference, so you want to dissipate the heat so that you can have a good performance of your uh, the heat pump system. But then the point here is that can we actually store the heat in the ground? And then during the summer, so, so that in winter, can we extract that heat and use that. So, so a little bit more enhanced heat pump system. And that's what we call it a little bit more advanced heating and cooling systems. So, so that is the idea we have, and we have to go to heat pump system anyway. And therefore we said, okay, let's uh, start thinking about what is the geothermal uh, uh, potential of our campus. And uh, so, so we went to the campus and say, do you have any, typical, typically these boreholes is like, um, 150 meters deep, 400 feet or 450 feet deep. And then I asked the campus, do you have any information about that? And they say they have no nothing about this data because most of the campus buildings are sitting on top of the bedrock, which is about 60 feet down. <laughs> so we got lots of data up to 60 feet down, but we have almost nothing data. But then uh, maybe you have the data, but I didn't have any data, campus didn't have any data. So, so we said, okay, we should do a little bit more in terms of finding out what are the properties of that ground rock and then how we can do as a geothermal uh, reservoir of our uh, system. So, so uh, first, uh, that's what we did is that we tried to get all the data to create where the soil deposits are and where the bedrock starts. So, so uh, we put a leapfrog program and then we drilled a borehole near the university house which you see it's very close to you. And then Taka was helping me to also get to seeing what we can do. Uh, so we had a drilling rig and then you can drill it. And then, so for first uh, few meter, uh, few two to 40 feet is uh, sort of a clay and sandy gravel. And then we go to Franciscan complex, which is really a good material. It's easy to drill. Sometimes we do have a shear zone. So that's interesting. Uh, I didn't see much of an issue of groundwater, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what are the permeability of this particular one, because uh, one of the issue is that if you store heat, if the groundwater carries away, it may not be good. But my feeling is that it's okay. Uh, it doesn't have much large permeability, but we'll find out. 
But we also did a VSNVP logging and trying to figure out how it looks like. What do you mean by a shared zone? What does that mean? I don't know. It just, when you take the sample out, it looks very seared. Oh, huh. okay. Yeah. And that's sort of reflected in a certain, I'm not sure it shows over here, but it shows some of the, that data logging. But, uh... Do you still have the drill? Yeah, so so we didn't do rock pouring. So so we have a drilling bit yeah. material. Yeah. But if you want, we have lots of it. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, I have a question about the storing of heat down there. Yes. I mean, that would work if if we would take as much energy in the winter when we are pumping down in the summer. Yes. But I mean, maybe I come from a cold country, but it seems like here it's pretty warm in the winter and very warm in the summer. So maybe we need much more cooling than heating. And so having an energy storage, you know, you don't have an energy balance between winter yeah, and so summer. So, yeah, so, so in, in building physics, we always look at the how to compensate each other. Uh, the cooling is becoming really dominant now in our campus because of their computers, data centers. So, so uh, uh, geothermal has been popular in the Silicon Valley. Google campus have borehole systems and to cool their data centers. So, so, so I think there's some demand, I think, but again, it's about making that balance right. So, so um, I'm just conscious about time, but we put fiber optics inside the borehole and also uh, put some and so still found at the bottom, so we're waiting for that uh, to be used. Okay. Yeah, and so, so we have a bowl hole with the fiber optics, so Richard or anybody can come and then put your DAS. And our thinking was that there are a lot of construction going on on the uh, the, the campus right now, so, right. so there are a lot of noise. And actually, we want to work with you to get more of a noise because uh, the probably the best application using this fiber is to detect the construction noise and then get rid of the claims that residents have to the construction companies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the applications. <laughs> but then uh, we get the temperature. So you get the temperature profile. This is the thermal gradient of that particular site. And it's a gradient, it's pretty good. It's a traditional good number. And then what we did is that we did a thermal um, response test. So we had a table inside the borehole, but then you know that when it, people put the pipes in, they, they just don't put nicely, they just twist it in and all these things, and the cable gets tangled off. And then we were trying to get these cable tubes in the right position, but it never works. So what we did is that we decided to put cable inside the tube as well to measure how much temperature is changing as you go along. So you dump the heat, and as the heat goes in, he diffuses into the ground, and then how we can get the thermal conductivity of the material. And then, as you can see, and it goes up. So, so we have a temperature cable going down, and then another cable going up, and then trying to measure the temperature change. So, heat high temperature in the inlet goes down, decreases, and then comes up and further decreases because you have a diffusion of the heat going into the ground. And then by that, we try to understand what is the thermal conductivity of the material by doing the analysis. And one thing we found is that actually, if you look at over here, the two cables sort of match each other very nicely and almost straight, implies that there's no heat transfer. And what we think, and of course, it's not difficult to say, uh, difficult to prove, but uh, actually this driller when they drilled it, actually they had a really difficulty grouting and they got the grout got stuck around up to here. So there's some issue in the borehole drilling and filling the grout up to this point. And then after that, it was happy to grab it. So, so there's a little bit interesting construction process that we, we looked at in this particular grout. But again, trying to entertain you say, the cable's here, so let's do something together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm now coming at five o'clock, so I know you want, my time is up, I guess. <laughs> so what I want to do is to, uh, yeah, so, so we get the temperature change with time and all these things that you know. 
So I had more other things to show, like piles and that sort of thing. But then uh, I think I had a problem explaining things very well in a timely manner today. But I'll come back again and then give you more time. <laughs> to go. But thank you very much for listening. And then I just wanted to uh, give you my email address saying that uh, please invite me again. <laughs> Great, thank you. We've had a lot of questions by now already, but are there other questions we want to come back to? I have a question again about the about this uh, uh, heat pump. Mm. So you, you said you don't want uh, you don't want to have a current uh, under under the earth. Wouldn't that wouldn't that mean that you have a much higher thermal capacity if all the heat is carried away? So wouldn't that be good for for cooling? So so it depends on the spirit of whether you want to diffuse the heat, or do you want to store the heat? And I think our current thinking is that we want to store the heat for for the winter. Uh, so store the heat during the summer. And then extract that heat during the winter. Uh, some uh, winter, sorry. And uh, that's what we want to do. So that's why we want to keep it. Yeah. And uh, in um, in our design, we tend to say groundwater is not very good for us. Yeah. I have a question from uh, the Zoom. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is about the type of interrogators that you are using, for instance, for the experiment with Ebb Mutt at the Claremont Hotel. Um, when we are doing uh, experiments with optical fibers, we are using essentially exclusively DAS um, machines. Yes. Uh, and we are looking at strain rate or at strain, depending on, on the output of the machine. Uh, but you are looking, for instance, uh, either for the uh, EBMAT experiment or for the uh, experiment at the university house, you're looking at various different physical changes in the fiber. Uh, what kind of DAS interrogators are you using for those? So we don't use DAS, which is a Rayleigh-based system. We use Brillion uh, devices. Actually, we make our own Brillion devices, which really looks at the brilliant scattering frequency and looking at the change because it allows us to do more static strain measurements. The problem with DAS is that you have to have the DAS system keep on running to get your, and then you can do compensation of the strain to get the static strain or small movement of the strain. But then um, the reason why you like to have strain rate is that you, you, you don't have to worry about this drift. So, so, so we use Brillion uh, type of strain uh, interrogator. So it's a different interrogator. And are your fibers, uh, could they be used uh, to attach a DAS to it? Yes, so we do use both. Actually our cables are really good for DAS because it's tightly buffered and therefore the response is much better than the, uh, the loose cables. Uh, we had a project with uh, Eagle Horse Shale uh, site uh, with the LBNL, and actually we did both DAS and uh, Brillion, and uh, we saw that the Brillion uh, gives good strain measurement, like static measurement, like the DAS, but the issue was that the, they were using cables that is easy to move, so the strain transfer is not as good. Okay, thank you. Yes. You didn't seem super concerned about uh, the flow of water, like of groundwater. And it's kind of surprising to me, right? We're right next to a large fault. You would expect the rock to be pretty damaged. Like, is your sense that the moment you're in bedrock, it's sufficiently insulated and like the amount of bedrock damage is not huge, really relevant or? I don't know is the but, answer. Yeah. Um... I know that groundwater uh, is high up the hill and then goes down. 
So, so that is for sure. The question is how fast it's moving. What is the permeability of it? Uh, perhaps that shear zone may have a higher permeability, but then as a overall system, does it have a high permeability? I don't know. So, so one thing that people tend to do was that they do temperature and then they heat the cable and then they see the dissipation of it. And based on that, they see the effect of groundwater. So, so we may be thinking of doing that at some point. But it, it, yeah, maybe it's a wish that it doesn't have a groundwater effect much. <laughs> this hole is grounded, so it's not possible to do a well test. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, yes, maybe another bowhole. And a monitoring one. Yeah, a monitoring one. Yeah. <laughs> But Kelly, your question is good. You know, of course, Strawberry Creek is fed by groundwater. That's why it's flowing year round. Well, that's the thing to like the groundwater velocities are big enough that the creeks here are part of perennial. Yes, but they're really surface deposit, right? I'm not sure how much is going through that hundred meters deep rock. So that's my question: is that what is happening at 150 meters deep in terms of groundwater? And I don't know. I have a question about you're working about the CT scale modeling, and uh, you got a lot of data from different kind of device. So in order to benchmark your data, you always need to build a numerical model, and then do something modeling to benchmark the data. Yes. I'm very curious about how can you generate this kind of system to do the numerical analysis. Uh, city scale of, like we do city scale um, of traffic simulations. And city scale. I, I, I noticed in your presentation, yes. there's a, a modeling. Of the ground. Yeah, and then uh -huh. all the, check, all the uh, power line and yes. the new one. And you don't know how about the influence of the old one. I, I found that you build a model and with the new one, and I think you can calculate the like the strain chain with the modeling. Yes. And uh, I feel, how can you benchmark this kind of data? Why is modeling? Why is the real data? It is. It can that be comparable? Or... Yes. I think I understand your question, and I think uh, one possibility is that I show you the big split basin test. Yeah. Yeah. So we do actual soil and the pipe and then share it to compare the actual ground movements and the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And then we also do really detailed modeling of the pipeline to look at how the joint moves yeah, yeah. and then doing the testing. So, so it's really about test, experimental test with a good like fiber optic strain data to verify our model is correct. And then the next step is that how do we create an upscale model because yeah. we can't model the details. So how do we create a surrogate models? Yeah, I think that. the models can be with different kind of scale. Yes. Yeah. So we have a surrogate model, which we call a fragility model, is that if you have a pipeline displacement or ground displacement of this, what is the probability of failure? So, so we do have that kind of a fragility models and we apply that for every models. So what we do is that we do a shaking of the ground and then uh, depending on the condition, you get this is peak ground velocity or how much ground movement it's gonna have after the earthquake. And then we look at what is the probability of failure. And after that, we look at probability failure of the, each pipeline, every pipeline. And then we do a water network simulations to say, okay, is this customer is gonna get water or not? And so we do that kind of simulations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so these are upscaling, yeah. Okay, well, there's plenty more opportunities to talk to Kitty. It's <laughs> right next door. But I think we should pause here. We will have um, beer and pizza on the balcony. Um, but let's thank uh, Kinchi again for coming. Yeah. The long journey.